Would you like to expand what you do with fire at Forest School? Do you want to learn how to manage your fire in a more... <laughs> flamey way? Flamey way. <laughs> Would you like to expand how you use fire at forest school? Maybe using it for different purposes, maybe learning more about how to control it and use it for different things. In this video, we're going to look at five different fire lays for different purposes and for different conditions. And I'm also gonna share some tips about different species of wood and how that might be beneficial for different fires. <laughs> so because forest school is a long-term program sometimes certain learners might get really focused in on particular topics and they might want to build on those topics over weeks or even months so if you've got learners at forest school who get really into fire lighting it's really useful to extend your own fire lighting and management knowledge so that you're then better able to support the learner's knowledge and understanding of those things. So this video is about trying to extend your knowledge about fire lighting. If you're completely new to fire lighting, then please do check out my other video about fire lighting. I'll put the link in the description below for you and that covers the basics. So this video, we're assuming you know the basics and we're looking at extending skills. So as I mentioned, this is the T fire lay, and you can see because of the height of it, it burns with a very big flame, a very tall flame. And the TP fire lay, I guess, would be a traditional fire lay used for if it was an evening and you wanted to sit around it, you needed a lot of lights or a lot of heat to keep warm by. It would be a good one to sit around a fire and sing songs or tell stories because you'll get a lot of light and heat from this fire lay. For light and heat it's no good for cooking on so if we did actually want to cook marshmallow or we wanted to toast some bread on a stick or something at the moment we couldn't do it on this fire it's too it's too flamey. What we're waiting for is for the teepee itself to collapse down and we want a nice bed of embers that is glowing but not flaming because we would just burn everything in this fire. So the next fire that we're gonna look at is the V-shaped fire lay. And this is particularly useful for if it's very windy conditions and you're wanting to be mindful about keeping the flame controlled and not it spreading and possibly causing harm or setting something alight that you don't wanna be alight. And, um, this is a fire lay that you could use to start a fire, just like we've used the TP fire lay to start a fire. You could use the V fire as a way of sheltering the flames in those early stages of lighting. As we've let our TP fire burn right down to embers, rather than start the whole process again, I'm gonna use these embers and put a bit of tinder and things into it to just to restart it. So it's a V shape, um, which is why it's called the V fire, funnily enough. And the apex of the V, the point of the V, is pointing in the direction of the wind. So I've got some pieces of stick here ready to go. And so I'm going to lay them. And I'm gonna make them join so that they crisscross at their ends, okay? And remember the wind's behind me. So then I'm gonna take the next one 
and place that on top and I'm going to continue doing that with my sticks. My sticks are a bit long so they're kind of hitting the uh, fire surround. So you can see I'm kind of interlocking those at the, at the tip. So what this is creating is it's creating a little sheltered space um, and it means that also because there isn't much of the stick on the downwind side it means that the flame isn't going to kind of get loose and travel a long way away. Um, it also means we've got this sheltered spot here which is if we were starting the fire from scratch, this is where we would put our tinder and maybe some of our very fine kindling in um, to get it going. So what I'm gonna do is we've already still got the heat here of the embers. So I'm gonna just kind of pop a bit extra birch bark in there and possibly some finer twigs. And we should find that the heat from the embers will be enough to reignite it. which this is a good tip in terms of fire management. If your fire has gone down to embers and is just glowing and you want it to get back up to flame, just move down the, the grades of wood, move that back down to the thinner grades of wood or your tinder and you'll find that that surface area will help um, reignite it. So that might go on its own in a minute with just the wind or I can speed it up potentially by blowing on it as well or flapping something at it. But you can see the smoke is starting to thicken. That might go on its own with the wind in a minute. So a little tip, if you don't want to get your face too close to the fire, particularly at forest school, to blow on the fire, if you find something that you can use to flap the fire, like this is just a lid off of a box, but it could be a plate or a fan or something, and you could just, then use that to flap the fire gently into flames and you see that extra kind of boost of oxygen gets it to take. So as I said this is particularly good for windy days to keep control of your fire. If you did want to um, boil some water or hang a pot over it, then potentially you could where it's flaming, where the, the, the V points meet. So you could get a little pot hanger and hang that up over the point where it's flaming. But because the wind's traveling this way, it means that the fire shouldn't travel down these sticks. It should always go in that direction so you can be in more control of it. So we're now going to change this fire lay into a star fire or a hunter's fire. And this is a particularly useful fire for hanging a kettle over or boiling a pot over. And it's very efficient in terms of use of fuel. So because these are nice and long sticks, I'm just going to handle them at the ends there just to dismantle the V. And we'll look at the star fire. So the star fire is basically wanting the sticks to all merge at a central point. So I'm taking the sticks and um, meaning that they all merge at a center point. Probably might not want those. So what that does is it contains the fire just at that very small center where the, all the sticks meet, where all the fuel meets. So you see it's quite a small fire. It's not flaming away like the teepee fire, for example. It's just quite a small, efficient fire. So if I was using this 
um, to boil a kettle, then I'd have my tripod or my pot hanger just over the centre point where the flame is more um, is more flamey. <laughs> um, and so that's uh, thinking from an environmental perspective. Of course, the more firewood you burn, the more resources from the woodland that you're using. So sometimes you don't need a big whopping fire, you just need to boil a kettle. So why would you want to burn, you know, twice or three times the amount of wood as you need? So the star fire is very efficient. Okay. So another feature of the star fire or the hunter's fire is it's relatively safe in, in terms of it's not a massive fire and it's unlikely to go out of control because all that happens is if, the, um, if you leave it for a while, the center of it burns down to embers like we have now and you see it's stopped flaming. So the flames haven't like escaped or traveled anywhere. Literally the middle has just stopped flaming. Um, so if I want to restoke that, I, all I need to do is start moving the pieces back together so that the heat kind of all builds in a, in a certain point. So I'm dragging the heat back over and the sticks back over and that should be enough even if it's been sort of left unmanaged for a little while that should be enough to restoke it either the wind will help restoke that itself or we can use the trick of the little flapper device just to give it a little kick start and there you go you're back into flame again if you you know you need to boil a kettle so it's quite an easy one to manage safely so i'm now going to change this fire lay again into a different shape this time we're going to do the crisscross fire lay which is almost the opposite to the star fire lay this one is really inefficient at use of fuel it takes a lot and lot of fuel but it is a really, really good cooking fire, particularly if you need embers. So say you were baking something in the Dutch oven or you were doing lots of stuff on the grill, you needed a good bed of embers to cook a lot of food, then the crisscross fire will be the one for you. And it is a bit what it says on the tin, it is a crisscross fire. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna carefully rearrange these sticks that we've got here to get straight into it. And I want my sticks all laying in the same direction for the first, for the first bit here. Okay, so I've got the first layer of sticks all parallel the first time. Then we're gonna go for the next layer up. sticks are a little bit long <laughs> for our fire surround and then we're gonna crisscross another layer on top of that and um, this works best if if the wood that you've got is all of a reasonably same diameter um, and then you'll get an even bed of coals um, when, it, when it burns down. Okay, so you see at the moment it looks like I've completely squashed the fire. It's completely kind of um, disappeared underneath the uh, weight of the crisscross. So again, I can give it a little flap start building the heat
and you can see that the fire is now starting to come up through the gaps and starting to build the heat. So with the crisscross fire, this is not a quick fire. This is something you need some time for because you need to wait for the flames to come up and to burn all the woods until it burns down to embers. So it's, um, it's a long fire. And you also have to guess how much wood you're going to need. So you have to stack all the wood up and guess how many embers you're going to need right at the beginning as well. So you can see once the wood pile gets fully ignited, it is quite flamey. There is quite a lot of heat coming off of it. Again, you can't cook on it, obviously, at this stage. It's, uh, it's not ready, so we need to continue to wait. Now, the thicker the pieces of wood, the longer you're going to have to wait for it to burn through. So if you've got very thick logs, you might want to split them um, so that they burn through more quickly. Um, as I said, you want wood of reasonably the same diameter so that they all become embers at the same point. So we'll leave this one for a few moments to burn up into some nice embers for us. It's warm. Melting, melting. So you can see that big crisscross pile of logs is now burnt right down to, um, to embers, which this is what we want if we're going to be cooking with it. So you can see that we've got a nice supply and they are reasonably the same size there as well. So that will help with any, any cooking we're doing. So it would be at this point that we would perhaps put our grill on. Um, just a tip and another item of PPE or personal protective equipment is you can get these um, fire gauntlets or heat proof gauntlets um, which I use particularly if I'm handling metal equipment that's going to get hot around the fire and also if your hands are coming quite close to the fire it gives some protection so because we have got our grill here we'll um, use the gloves and put them on and so you can see that well there are a few flamey bits but you could use your poking stick just to move those to one side and then you've got just the, the heat there which you can feel the temperature there so if you wanted to grill some sausages or whatever you wanted to put on the grill that would be perfect for that or you could also use the dutch oven and use the embers with the dutch oven using that fire lay so the last fire lay i'd like to show you is called the long log fire lay and unlike the others that we've looked at this one isn't really designed for cooking but it's actually more designed for sleeping next to in very cold conditions um, so we're not actually going to light this one and I'm not going to do it in full size. Um, I'm going to do it in miniature because normally this fire lay would be the length of a person's height. So if you imagine in cold countries where you might be sleeping outside all year round, um, Scandinavia, Canada, those sorts of places, you might need to sleep next to a fire to stay warm enough, particularly in the winter months. And so this is the sort of fire that's designed to go alongside of like a lean-to shelter, which you may have seen. Um, they're like diagonal roofed shelters, but with one side completely open. Uh, and the, the reason that side's open is because you then have this long log fire that then reflects in the heat into the shelter and keeps you nice and toasty, even if it is like, you know, minus 40 outside. So um, that's kind of the function of, of this fire. So I'm going to start off by putting two posts into the ground. I've just sharpened the end of them. Oh dear, I need a better mallet. 
<laughs> really need a better mallet. So you've got two posts in and now I, I'm building it as if I was going to sleep on the side where you're looking at it from so I'm kind of would be facing where the shelter would be so the angle that you're looking at it is like from the shelter. Now these two posts uh, are slightly angled and the reason for that is the fire usually has a reflector as part of it as well so you, you would lay some sticks at the base um, and that would act as like your normal hearth, your normal um, raft of sticks that you would then light your fires on. And then if you imagine you would start some fires and um, with the size of this, you probably would start at least sort of three fires along the base, like starting with that TP shape is usually a good shape to start your fires from. So you would do like three fires along um, and then you would add wood. And the reason for these sticks angled up is you can make like a reflector. So Kind of like a little fence, a little wall that you can build up and it will reflect the heat from the fire into your shelter. But it also has another function, Ooh. <laughs> which is doing what, what I wanted to do there, is it, it self feeds the fire. So as the bottom ones burn, as the bottom sticks burn, you would want it to kind of like roll out and sort of self-feed the fire. So if you're asleep, um, you know, it can be a drag to keep having to wake up and stoke the fire up to keep warm. Whereas with this system, potentially, you've got a way of the fire self-feeding and hopefully burning for a bit longer. So you would have you know, a bigger reflector fence. And of course that could come right up here. So you've got this big fence and it keeps you nice and warm. Um, so if I was sleeping in it, um, on average, you would be about a, like a big step, one big stride away from the fire would be a good spot of course there is a balance between keeping warm and then making sure <laughs> that you don't catch sparks or anything into your sleeping kit or into your den itself so obviously if you are particularly using synthetic fabrics um, and materials like bivy bags and sleeping bags that you're sleeping in of course you don't want to get them too close to the fire because they will start to melt um, but on average like one big giant stride away from the fire is a good spot to be um, to keep nice and warm. So that is your long log fire. So just a reminder for some basic fire management tips is if you find that you're getting too much heat from a fire, you know, it's burning things or cooking things too quickly, you just spread apart the embers and that will disperse the heat and cool down the temperature of your fire. So you can reduce the temperature, turn down that thermostat by spreading things apart. If you want the opposite, if you want more heat, say it's been burning for a while and you notice things, the cooking speed is slowed down, then you want to drag things together. You want to pull those things together and that will actually build the heat. And um, at the moment we've got embers on our fire, so that's fine for grilling or baking. But if we wanted flame to start again, say we wanted to boil the kettle or um, we had a soup or something that we wanted to boil over it and we wanted the flame back, 
Then to re-get the flame, we're gonna just add some smaller diameter wood again, or you could use some more tindery birch bark as well. So you can go down that diameter, starting small and building up. And again, either if it's a windy day, the wind might start that for us, or we can use our little flapper to just give that a bit of a start. And then you're back into flame. If you want it to continue as a flame um, for some time, then you could add thicker pieces of wood once you've got it flaming with the thinner pieces. You could start adding those thumb thickness or okay thickness, um, just as the way you would when you're starting a fire, lighting a fire. So I also wanted to share a little bit of information about wood species selection for your firewood. So in the beginner's fire video, we did cover about collecting wood that's hanging in trees so looking for dead wood that's up off the ground so that the wind will have dried it. Um, you can refine your firewood selection process by knowing a little bit about the species and different woods have different properties so they burn in different ways and they also have different moisture contents meaning that some make better firewoods than others. So in terms of species selection, at the beginning of lighting a fire, where you want lovely fine pieces that are gonna set fire quickly and with a lot of flame and build a lot of heat, you might want to look for conifer species uh, and or something like birch, silver birch or downy birch. And um, the reason I would suggest those species is because all of those have resins within the wood, which actually are quite flammable. And so you may have tried using birch bark, for example, as a tinder, and you would know that, that once it takes, it goes beautifully and builds with a lot of heat and burns with a really bright flame. So those softer woods, those conifers and things like birch, they're softer woods, they burn very, very quickly but at the beginning of your fire they can build a lot of heat so they're really good. Those species often also tend to have very slim twigs, very slender twigs which is great for surface area when you're getting those handfuls of kindling on top of your tinder bundle um, which will maximise the building of heat. However, if you're going to cook on your fire, and particularly if you're going to cook over something where you need a bed of embers, like if you were going to bake something in the Dutch oven, or even if you were going to grill a lot of stuff on a, a grill and you needed a nice bed of embers to keep that heat going, then those species aren't really going to do the trick because they burn away real quick into nothing. So if you're wanting slower burning more dense woods there are kind of four which are really really good so there's ash there's oak there's beech and there's sweet chestnut and those four are kind of the lovely poshest firewoods you can get for for embers for burning for a long time in fact some of them like oak will burn a bit like coal you know you get really really hot embers that stay in nice lumps um, for you to use if you're doing something in the dutch oven for example so they're all really good ash out of interest has the lowest moisture content out of all of the woods as well so ash in particular is known as the king of firewoods um, so that's one to look out for. Um, you can of course burn other species, so um, the other species are kind of in the middle, so things like hazel burns nicely, but um, you know that's sort of a middle kind of density woods. Um, also things like rowan and hawthorn, they, they burn very well as well. There are some species that perhaps are better avoided as firewoods um, because they don't really burn in a nice way so um, there are things like elm that really doesn't burn it's sort of just smoulders away doesn't doesn't seem to get hot ironically for for firewood um, also poplar the poplar species they um, tend to be very slow burning and they're also not very dense because they've got a high moisture content there's not much left to them um, in fact that's why matches are made out of poplar because they burn so slowly 
Um, then you've also got elder when it's young and very pithy in the min middle i'm sure you've maybe made beads or whistles and things out of elder you've got that lovely pith that you can pop out the center um, of those thinner shoots then um, that's great for making beads and crafts but in terms of firewood again you've got a lot of moisture and not much wood in in those pithy sections elder's fine once it gets bigger and the pith is much more small but the thin branches um, are really no good as a firewood there are also some species um, that spit so they'll crackle and spit and bits of little ember might come popping out so um, a, a couple that do that are sweet chestnut which actually is a very good firewood but it does go pop and then suddenly a little ember might come flying out. Um, willow also tends to do that as well. Um, willow isn't such a great firewood. Again, it's not very dense because it's very high in moisture content, being a, a water-loving species. If you're interested in finding out more about the different properties of different woods, I've found this book particularly useful. Um, it's called British Native Trees, their past and present uses, including a guide to burning wood in the home. Uh, and it's by Piers Warren. And um, in there, it's got each of the native species. It tells you a little bit about the properties, what the traditional uses are, what some of the current day uses are, and then how well it burns as a firewood as well. So that's a really handy little book. Um, I'll put a link in the description below. There's also a traditional poem called Logs to Burn that explains all about the different species of wood and how well they burn. Um, I'm afraid I don't know who wrote the poem. In fact, it might be an anonymous poem, but it's quite an old poem. And it starts, logs to burn, logs to burn, logs to save the coal a turn. And then it will go through all the different species about whether they burn well or bright or good for baking bread and all sorts of things. But uh, the outcome of the poem is that ash is the king of the firewoods. So we've looked at five different fire lays that hopefully will help you manage your fire for different purposes. And we've also looked at different species of tree and what makes good firewoods or not so good firewoods. So I hope these tips will be useful and extend your fire skills at forest school. If you've enjoyed this video, do give us a like and a thumbs up and subscribe so you can join us in the woods next time. And thanks for watching. <laughs> Arranging your fire in different ways means you can use it in various ways. Crisscross, star, <laughs> TPP. <laughs> 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 Arranging your fire in different ways means you can use it in various ways. Crisscross, star, TP and V. <laughs> <laughs> so focused on the actual what's coming next. Scatter your wood and head to the truth. Okay, this time, this time, this time, here we go. Arranging your fire in different ways means you can use it in various ways. Crisscross, star, TP and Vs. Gather your wood and head to the trees. <laughs> Very good. <laughs>